We're going to be looking at uh, Ephesians here. I started out in 1 Timothy. We're going to get to 1 Timothy next week. Never got out of Ephesians chapter 6. So if you want to go to Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to be there in just a little while. Uh, I kind of view this first as we enter the first of the year. These are kind of going back to the basics, kind of like in football practice or wrestling practice or basketball or whatever sport you happen to love. Every year you have the training camps and you go back and you go back to the basics. Are we doing the basics right? And then we can build off that solid foundation and make things work. And we're all praying that the Packers basics are working right and that <laughs> God act on their behalf today. So that'll be great. Ooh, whenever a glass is half full, might not be good because it might be left from next week, last week. <laughs> Okay, but last week we were reminded of our purposes as a church, and we talked about the four C's, so let's review them. C number one is what? Anybody know? Celebrate. We're here to celebrate God through our, our worship. Second C, cultivate a personal relationship with God through Christ, or, personally, or cultivate personal growth in Christ. Uh, third is care. Care for one another in Christ. And lastly, to communicate Christ to our world. Four C's. Celebrate, cultivate, care, and communicate. And they seem to be pretty straightforward. I doubt if anything, and I said in the message that way last week, was confusing to anyone. And today, even to this day, even though I, I've preached this, this, a similar sermon, uh, just about every year that I've been with, 20-some years now, uh, to this day I've never had anyone challenge the worthiness of those purpose statements. And they seem, on the surface, rooted in biblical truth, and they seem to elucidate a direction that is undeniably worthy of God. Nevertheless... We live in a time where things don't always seem to be what they truly are. Would you agree with that? Okay. The God that we celebrate, the God with whom we seek a relationship, the God through whom we care for one another, and the God we communicate to this world, uh, must be the one true, transcendent, almighty, eternal God of the Bible. The God who the Apostle Paul described to Timothy as being the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God to whom be given honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That one last statement summed up a lot of the content of several of the songs that we've already sung this morning. But what if, what if in this increasingly secular world, churches who believe themselves to be God's mouthpieces here on earth, what if they no longer know him? What if they've come to know a corrupted version of him? What if the churches themselves, sometimes unknowingly, have become secularized? Now let's take a moment and consider the word secular. What does it mean? It is a word that is commonly heard these days in newsrooms as commentators describe certain kinds of societies. Many countries, including ours these days, are now considered by many to be secular democracies. Under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in the 1920s and 30s, uh, Turkey, a Muslim nation, began to move towards what was perceived as Western secularism and away from the strong influence of the mullahs of Islam. He broke, at least temporarily, 
the Islamic hold in power in Turkey. In democracies, these shifts are the result of the will of the people and those institutions that influence the people. True, secular societies make laws and give deference to the worldview that religion has no place in the public square and should not be used as rationale for public policy. Okay, let me read that again because it's really critical. In secular societies, they make laws and give deference to the worldview that religion uh, has no place in the public square and should not be used as rationale for public policy. In other words, man's laws trump what various religious groups believe are God's laws. Secular is a world that derives in part from ancient understandings related to seeds and the germination of those seeds. In other words, secularism is understanding that grows from the seed of the finite thinking of human beings, not from the infinite mind of God. A secular society is one that does not officially factor in anything that is perceived as divine or transcendent. Now when I say transcendent, we're talking about things that are not of this world. Divine has to do with things that are beyond this world. As the world, as things, be, as things are ordered. Secularism purposefully deprives itself of God. It must because it does not know God. If it did, it wouldn't. As Christians, we do know God. And because we do know God, we must not deprive our culture of his influence. Does that make sense? We are one of the institutions that influences people in democracies. So what happened? Well, what if God's word, the Bible, becomes no longer authoritative in the churches themselves by virtue of new interpretations that no longer originate from the guiding power and the influence of God's Holy Spirit, but rather from the teachings of humans that no longer know God and uh, respect his sovereign word? You see what's coming. What if churches that orchestrate worship and religious education and care ministries and evangelism are guided by the wisdom of human intellectual strivings that reject the ultimate authority of a transcendent God? Now, what do their four C's now offer? And this, my dear church, is the challenge of the times in which we live. At Walnut Hill, if we are going to shine in this dark world with other churches all over the world that continue to shine and be part of the bride of Christ and the beauty of Christ, then we must stand firm in our faith, the ancient faith, a transcendent faith. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 10 with that introduction to stand firm. Ephesians chapter 6, sorry, beginning at verse 10. Sorry. If you find Ephesians 10, go find another Bible. So. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so let us be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his, I'm going to be adding, I'm going to be doing some commentary as we go through this, in his might, his transcendent might, a might that is not bound by the powers of this earth. That's where our strength comes from, from a transcendent God, which makes it superior to all other strengths if we walk 
in it. And we're told to put on the whole armor of God. If you're putting on armor, what are you expecting to happen? A battle, right? There's going to be a battle. And here the scriptures are telling us, and God is telling us, as my children in this world expect to be in the midst of battles. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It gives us some context there. The things that we are fighting. You see, the interesting thing about all this is the battle is transcendent too. You see. Now Satan has been cast down to this world, but not uh, bound by the laws of this world either, as are we. The schemes of the devil are tactical. In theistic cultures, cultures that believe in God or gods, the devil's scheme lead people away from the one true God and towards lesser deities. That way he destroys them. This was true in New Testament times. Paul's arguments on Mars Hills with the intellectuals of his day in Athens appealed to an intelligentsia that believed in transcendent gods. Today, however, we appeal primarily to a non-theistic culture. And the devil's schemes tactically lead people away from the one true God and towards uh, secularism and the belief that the thought of a transcendent God in any form is anti-intellectual and therefore foolish. The devil's schemes for undermining the foundation of the church is to allow the beliefs created by the secular world to supplant the foundational teachings of God's word. The devil's schemes will, in essence, hand the church over to the world, and it will cease to accomplish God's purposes, but will accomplish the purposes of the world. The light of truth is then dimmed, and eventually, in many churches these days, extinguished. What is happening to every denomination and church that walks a path that allows for the encroachment of secularism? Just think about that question for a minute. What is happening to every denomination and church that walks a path that allows for the encroachment of secularism? They're all in decline, okay? Every one of them is in decline. Why? Forgotten is the truth that, verse 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're fighting against transcendent powers with earthly power. And so we get, you know, oh, I could do that better. There we go. <clears throat> Note, and this is critical. Secularism, a belief system that denies the existence of the transcendent spiritual forces, is led by transcendent spiritual forces. Okay? Secularism... The belief system that denies the presence of spiritual forces is led by spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. How do we know? Because the enemy of the true church is not flesh and blood. It is not of this earth. How ironic. The incongruity that we see here if it were not so devastatingly serious, it would be laughable. Secularists don't believe in the intellectual forces that determine their own intellectual endeavors. And sadly, they have been and are being deceived. And the deception is, of course, the work of the devil, Satan, the father of lies who speaks the language of deceit. 
and has from the beginning. Verse 13. Therefore, what must the church do? Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So let's talk a little bit about this evil in our day that we've identified as secularism. As a culture, and for good reason, we celebrate various aspects of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the technological advances that are both wonderful and at the same time frustrating. I don't know about you, but by the time I finally purchase something and learn how to manipulate this advanced technology, a week later it is now obsolete and Andy wants me down at his store buying a new phone. <laughs> Sorry, Andy, he really doesn't do that to me. He just sends me advertisements in the mail telling me those things. But secularism is rooted in the idea that humanity can do anything and therefore God is now obsolete. See, Humanity can do anything and now God is obsolete. And this is the unfortunate, uh, some of the unfortunate byproduct of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Re Industrial Revolution and so on. The understanding of phenomena that was once considered beyond human comprehension is now called natural phenomena. Now think about that wording, it's important. Natural phenomena, part of the natural world and is therefore understandable. It is interesting to me that despite the advancements of the various disciplines of science, the greatest minds are still baffled by innumerable queries. And it is not that these questions cannot be known. It is, only, it, it is that only God fully knows all things and integrates them into each other with a capacity for genius and precision, precision that is rooted in so much that is unknowable. Try as we might, we cannot see with precision what once was and will be. We can predict once was and we can make up and we can, we can uh, develop theories about what, about what once was, but we cannot know them with certainty. We, have a, we worship a God who doesn't live in time like we do. And all of the things in the future and all of the things in the past exist within the realm of theory, an arena where God is not bound. Robert Moeller writes this, regardless of these things, secularization theory has now emerged as an academic discipline. Most of the contributors to this theory argue that secularization was the handmaiden to modernity. As these theorists explain, the modern age would necessarily and inevitably produce a secular society because modernity made God irrelevant. Modernism provided alternative answers to the most fundamental questions of life thereby rendering theism no longer necessary. This is what Charles Darwin was in the midst of. In 1965, some of you might remember a book that came out. It was extremely influential. Uh, and it was entitled The Secular City. And Harvey Cox described what secularism would look like if it played out as the ruling ideology in a society. The Christian world was taken aback by the book for they had not realized how much uh, of Cox's book had already become a reality in many of the countries, our country's major urban areas. I've talked with a number of Gen Xers and Millennials who listen to me about the world in which I grew up in. 
<clears throat> this is where I don't want to lose half of the congregation. I know I'm going to have some of you, but I want all of you, especially the young people. And it's because when I say these things to my own children, they look at me with skepticism. They don't seem to be able to fully comprehend a culture where stores were closed on Sundays. Or public school days started with the playing of the national anthem, the Pledge of Allegiance, and prayer. And every kid in my class went to church on Sunday. One of them went to church on Saturday, and he was the odd one. They went to church somewhere. All of them did. Does that reflect anybody else's background? Yeah. It would be interesting to see what happened if our children in the public schools did, had a poll on how many of your classmates go to church today. It was in an age where politicians who betrayed their faith, because you couldn't really get into office unless you professed to be a Christian, okay? But politicians who be betrayed their faith through scandal in office, they were not removed. They removed themselves. Do you remember that? You know, in just 12 years before Secular City was written, Dwight D. Eisenhower, general, now president, a professing Christian, made a public profession of his faith in Christ and was baptized shortly after his inauguration while in office. So yes, in the United States that still publicly acknowledged that we were a Christian nation with a voting majority that demanded our leaders lead us as Christians, the change to secularism crept up on us slowly until today it is the major ideology that reigns in our government, our courts, in the walls of academia, halls of academia, and our public schools. And as we are currently becoming aware, even in our churches. Now God has something to say about all of this, and he implores the believer to respond in a particular way. And today, what is considered a peculiar way. Verse 14, stand, he says, therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Because it is the deceptions and the lies that are the devil's weapons of war, you see. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, you know, and righteousness is just a big word that means doing what's right in the eyes of God. Okay? That's what righteousness is, doing what's right, living what is right, living in accordance to what we believe is true, living in accordance with the truth we preach and we believe. It is rejecting hypocrisy and being consistent and upright. And verse 15 says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now in this English uh, standard version translations, we, it, we see this emphasis on the importance of our readiness and willingness to engage this culture of ours that promises false peace with the gospel of true peace that is found only in the transcendent God of peace through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the prince of peace. Verse 16. And in all circumstances, take up that shield of faith. The truth, <clears throat> like a shield, is what gets pounded in battle these days. Excuse me. I'm going to try this one. It's full. It 
that gets pounded because it is what we constantly hold up to fend off, of, fend off the lies. It is the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one, of the enemy. And boy, do the darts come once you've engaged the culture. You can be quiet at home and never engage anybody, and you don't really have a sense so much of the darts. But speak up and speak the truth in love and speak it boldly and speak it humbly and watch the barrage come your way. One after another, one dart after another, carefully aimed at every weak spot the enemy sees in our armor. And here they come. Give up on your marriage. Don't believe what the Bible says about its sanctity. Go ahead, move in together, and give the relationship a spin before making a commitment. You don't have to believe what God says about having intimate relationships with other people before you get married. Times have changed. Yes, they have. You're being influenced now by earthly secular thinking. The Bible's wrong about the sanctity of life. Babies aren't real people yet. The religious zealots who are always condemning Planned Parenthood for the manner in which they help women by taking the lives of their children are just unenlightened, backward-thinking remnants of the past. What the Bible says about homosexuality is cruel and at the very least antiquated instruction rooted in irrational fears. You've got to be mean and ignorant to believe that the LGBT communities are anything but wonderful and even God-fearing people. The Bible is wrong, the darts say. And so the fiery darts by this come from the secular scatter guns and they pepper us with lies. So, verse 17, take up your helmet of salvation because now what you now that you are a believer and a follower of Jesus, you belong to God and are part of his kingdom adopted into his family. And so we listen to him as the Lord of our lives. We are part of a transcendent kingdom that is not of this world. So we shouldn't expect our thinking to align itself with this world. We are not backwards. Our God is not a backward God. He is just consistently and always true. And all of the ground is sinking sand. You know, after secularism runs its course, it's going to be something else. Just like after modernism ran its course, it was something else. Postmodernism has run its course, and now there is something else. All of the ground but Christ is sinking sand. Yesterday, today, forever, God, you're the same. It's who you are. It's who you will always be. See, that's why we sing these songs. They reinforce these truths in our lives. And back to verse 17, he gives us the sword of the Spirit. And then that's defined, which is the Word of God. The Bible, which is trustworthy, and the Bible, which is true, Given with the understanding that, this is from 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for the things that we're doing here. Teaching, uh, reproof, correction, and for training in what is right. Training in righteousness. The Bible is not a divine suggestion as to how you may want to try to live your life. It is a holy owner's manual written by the one who created you and created the earth upon, upon which we live, who is the creator of culture and beauty and all that is good and praiseworthy. And we live by the word of God. 
It is the bread of life. And because it is God's word, and we are dependent upon God for our understanding of his word, we must be, verse 18, praying at all times in his spirit, controlled by his spirit, with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, this is coming up to the conclusion now. We're going to let the Bible do the conclusion of our sermon today. To that end, we need to stay alert. Persevere in staying alert. And also praying for everyone else around us. Making supplication for all the saints. Why? Because the battle will continue. But we will walk in him. And in him is victory. Amen? Uh, next week, I want to continue to teach about the purpose of the church under the microscope of Paul's, Paul's first letter to Timothy, but within the context of a secular age, the one in which we live and move and have our being. For my heart is to encourage you to live in God, to move in God, and to find your being in God so that together we can move in him, both now how long? Forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now you can stand and leave and say hi to anybody that you didn't get to say hi to when we had you greet people before. God bless you. <laughs>